It gives me great pleasure today to introduce one of the seminal thinkers and truly scintillating intellects of the conservative movement in America today. Bill Kristol is chairman of the project for the Republican future. Note it's the, not a. I like the confidence he built into that. And has shown through with weapons little beyond a phone, a fax, and a creative mind the power of ideas to shape our public policy debate in this country. In many ways, Bill has shown why organizations like the Georgia Public Policy Foundation are important, because ideas are important in politics, and he has shown that very vividly over the last couple of years, as, as well as before that. Bill, like our last speaker, Phil Graham, like Dick Armey, like Newt Gingrich, is a conservative refugee from academia. He has a bachelor's and doctorate degree in government from Harvard, and he has taught at both Harvard and University of Pennsylvania. I first heard about Bill some 10 years ago when one of the top aides to Bill Bennett at the Department of Education said, this guy you need to keep an eye on. This Bill Crystal fella has quickly made himself indispensable around here. He later went from the Department of Education under Bill Bennett to serve as Dan Quayle's chief of staff. Bill has the unique ability to see things before others see them. And we know in business or stock picking or <laughs> politics, that's a very great gift. He was one of the first to help frame the importance of the entire values debate in this country and was instrumental in the famous Murphy Brown speech that you all know about. And by the way, if you haven't listened to that entire speech, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, all we hear about is the Murphy Brown part of it, but it was a, is an excellent speech that was ahead of the curve in identifying the breakdown in values as a critical problem. You may recall a sharp change in the debate on health care a little over a year ago. At one point, the Clinton administration was talking about how health care was in crisis and we really needed to junk the entire system and start over. It was a Bill Crystal memo that first said, wait a minute, there's not a crisis here. There's a problem that we need to address, but there's not a crisis that we need to junk an entire system for. And it, at, from that memo on, you started to see the thinking change in Washington. As a result of the influence he's had, he's been the subject of a number of quotes in popular media. Uh, Newsweek magazine says that Crystal might be the cerebral cortex for the entire GOP. William Sapphire, the New York Times columnist, has called him the faxing philosopher of the majoritarian movement. Tony Coelho, the Democratic strategist, has said he's the big gorilla of political gurus. But my favorite one comes from the President of the United States, who, with a touch of bitterness in his voice, said, yeah, Bill Crystal, he's that guy in Washington who tells the Republicans what to think. Through it all, he's managed to remain a decent, level-headed guy who hasn't let his fame go to his head. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today, Bill Crystal. Well, thank you very much, uh, Whit, for that excessively kind introduction. I, um, it's great to be here in Georgia. Tom Perdue encouraged me to uh, be candid, tell the truth. I told him I come from Washington, I can't do that. <laughs> the, uh, Washington, D.C., as you know, has an excellent new mayor, Marion Barry, I guess, uh, who, who is famous for many things. But one of the things he's famous for is a statement of his a few years ago where he was accused by a reporter of uh, dissembling, of misleading the reporter. And he said, you have to understand, Marion Barry said, there are two kinds of truth. He was accused of not telling the truth. And he said, there are two kinds of truth. Um, there were real truths, and there were made-up truths. <laughs> which is a perfect, which is really sort of Washington at its best, I always, uh, I always, I always think. Um, it's great to be here in the district of the Speaker of the House. I can't quite get used to that. Um, I still think of Tip O'Neill as the Speaker, because I taught, uh, as Witt said, at the Kennedy School of Government. I lived in Tip O'Neill's congressional di district when he was Speaker. I was the uh, I was the token Republican and the token conservative at the Kennedy School of Government. They like to keep one there, you know, sort of like endangered species at the zoo, you know, <laughs> you see what they're like. Um, the Kennedy School of Government, as you know, was recently in the news because Barbara Streisand was invited to share her wisdom with the Harvard students. And uh, 
it seemed to me they should have had Brooke Shields, who I remember, you know, Hollywood's a wonderful place. Brooke Shields, um, I remember this a few years ago when I was in the Reagan administration, I think, came to Washington to announce a big um, uh, participation in a big anti-smoking campaign. And she solemnly told a huge press conference, obviously, you know, 25 cameras, 40 reporters. Um, she told the press conference, Brooke Shields, that smoking kills. Uh, and if you're killed, you know, you've lost a very important part of your life. <laughs> so the, um, I was, I guess, you know, I think she would have done a good job at the Kennedy School <laughs> instead of Barbara. The, um, but uh, I'll just one quick Tip O'Neill story, or at least Kennedy School story. Um, uh, this is sort of what it's like to live in Massachusetts, especially in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I remember voting in November 84. Uh, I voted for Ronald Reagan for re-election for the presidency, and I voted for the Republican candidate for Senate who was running against John Kerry. Um, and I voted as a dutiful Republican against Tip O'Neill for Congress, even though it was, a, of course, a safe district and he was going to win overwhelmingly. <coughs> Excuse me. And I remember the next morning asking, uh, my wife was reading the, you know, the newspaper, looking at the election returns, and I knew, of course, that Reagan had won uh, overwhelmingly, and I knew that uh, we'd lost the Senate race, the Republican had lost the Senate race, and I asked Susan, how did that Republican candidate uh, who was running against Tip O'Neill, just you know, out of curiosity, uh, how did he do? And Susan looked down the election tables uh, and said, there was no Republican candidate running against Tip O'Neill. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I said, well, I know I voted for someone uh, against him. And it turned out I had voted for the communist. Um, <laughs> this is a, uh, this is a true, uh, a true story. I was always worried this would stop me from getting a job in the Reagan administration, but, <laughs> but they understood perfectly when I explained the, uh, the choice. I actually told this story uh, just about three weeks ago. I debated Susan Estrich, uh, a very nice lady who ran Dukakis's campaign in 88, who teaches law out at, in Southern California. I debated her out in LA on the west side, the west side of Los Angeles, an extremely liberal audience. There were about 400 people in the audience, and I would say 390 of them were on Susan's side, and 10 of them were undecided. You know, right? So I thought I would break the ice a little bit, and I told this, I think, somewhat amusing and true story about Tip O'Neill, and I told the story, it was dead silence. You know, in the room, no one laughed. They kind of, they couldn't see what was funny. You know, what was the, <laughs> what's the joke? Tough choice, you know? <laughs> um, um, and I'm glad to be with a somewhat uh, friendlier group today. Um, let me, let me be brief, because I, I really would like to, to hear what's on your mind and, and, and uh, take your questions and, and comments. I, well, I had actually, uh, you don't enforce uh, brevity on speakers as much. I, I recently spoke in Houston to a Rotary Club where I asked before getting up, you know, I asked the host, how long do you want me to speak and take questions? And he said, well, you can speak as long as you want, uh, but everyone in the audience leaves at 1.30. <laughs> 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 it's just sort of an interesting way to enforce, you know, time limits. <laughs> I told them they should be careful not to have Bill Clinton speak down there. It's <laughs> kind of rude to walk out on the President of the United States when he's just a third of the way through his speech. Or whatever. The, um, let me talk for a minute about the 94 election and uh, what its meaning is or was and, uh, and about its implications for 95 and 96. Um, I think 94 really was a political and policy watershed. Uh, there's been a lot of analysis, a lot of talk about 94, but I think we still don't quite appreciate, or a lot of people don't quite appreciate, how important an election it was. Uh, it did mark the end of 60 years. Well, let me just talk about it from a political point of view, partisan point of view, uh, and then a policy uh, point of view. In terms of politics, political parties, it did mark the end of 60 years of dominance by the Democratic Party in the United States. And I don't say this as a Republican, but simply as a, you know, as an analytical matter. The Democrats have been the majority party since Roosevelt. Uh, they held that status despite Nixon's big victory in 72, despite Reagan's victory in 80, where he brought in a Republican Senate. Republicans lost the Senate, of course, in 86. Uh, and as recently as 1992, Democrats had comfortable majorities in both houses of Congress, comfortable majority of governor's mansions, two to one majority in state legislative chambers across the country. So for all the erosion of the New Deal coalition, especially here in the South, Democrats were still comfortably the majority party uh, in 1993, 1994. And that did end on November 8th, 1994, and it ended suddenly. Republicans now control Congress, uh, obviously by narrow margins. Republicans have 30 governorships with 71% of the American people having a Republican governor, which is a pretty big number. Uh, and most interestingly, 
Whereas the day before November 8th, on November 7th, Democrats controlled, I think, 64 state legislative chambers. Republicans controlled 32, and there were a couple uh, that were tied. Uh, on November 9th, Republicans controlled 50, uh, and Democrats controlled 47. That's one of the largest shifts in state legislative chamber control on a single election day uh, in U.S. history. And I think it gives a sense of the magnitude of what happened on November 8th, just from a party point of view, uh, but also the extent to which we, we suddenly an era ended. In retrospect, we can see that the Democratic majority, the Democratic coalition was eroding uh, over the last quarter century, uh, but it did end, and I think that's an important fact. You know, political eras don't end that often in American politics. They tend to go for 30 years or 60 years in this case, I would argue, a New Deal, Great Society era, and, and, now, it's, and now it's over. Um, it ended in an election that was one of the most partisan elections uh, of modern times. Political scientists have been saying for the last 25, 30 years, as Whitwell knows, that you know you can't. He wasn't saying it, but his, our colleagues were saying it. Um, you can't have these kinds of partisan sweeps anymore. Voters are independent; they split their tickets. The party organizations are weak. The modern media mean, means that you can't have an 1890s type election, the kind of election you read about in history books. But what we had in 1994 was really an 1890s type election, a huge partisan swing from the Democrats to the Republicans. Remember all that talk about anti-incumbency, throw the bums out, voters are going to lash out against whoever's in power? Not true. Didn't happen. Uh, every single incumbent Republican governor, senator, and congressman won. Almost every single incumbent Republican state office holder at any level won, including state legislators. I think the number of Republican incumbent state legislators who lost across the nation is something like 22. I mean, it's a ludicrously low number. Republican incumbents were safe and did fine. Um, there's a big swing from Democrats to Republicans. Again, kind of election that we were told couldn't happen anymore, and it really hasn't happened in a long time, um, and, and that uh, did happen on November 8th. A classic realigning election. These, these political eras tend to end with an election that political scientists call a realigning election. Sudden, dramatic, partisan move. And that's what we had on November 8th. We also, realigning elections also tend to be ideological elections. And I do think that the election of November 1994 was one of the most ideological off-year elections in modern times. Um, you had Republicans running on the contract with America, pretty clear vision of the way they wanted to take the country, pretty bold, less government, lower taxes, pretty big reform of regulation, big reform of the legal system, big welfare reform. Uh, Clinton attacked the contract with America, nationalized the election, made it a referendum on Clintonomics versus Reaganomics, you know, attacked the contract as a sort of Reaganism redux, as he said. Um, you had a very rare thing in American politics, which is a nationalized off-year election. Um, and especially rare because other nationalized off-year elections, like 1974, you know, 1982 to some degree, uh, were nationalized by a scandal or by a recession case of 82, or a scandal, Watergate in the case of 74, um, or a crisis of some sort, foreign policy crisis in the case of Vietnam a little bit in 66. Um, there was no crisis in 94. The economy was pretty good shape. Foreign policy was shaky, but there was no horrible, you know, involvement of tens of thousands of U.S. troops anywhere. Um, scandal, there was white water, but it didn't really, hadn't really broken through. One of the most striking things about the November 94 election, and I don't think this is something that's been sort of appreciated enough, is what a purely uh, almost ideological and issues-driven election it was. The American people, and again, leaving aside the merits and leaving aside the, 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 the fairness of the characterizations of the two parties, the American people sort of had two, a really clear choice between two different visions uh, of the future, a sort of an updated Reaganite vision, if you want to call it that, um, and uh, a Clinton vision that was defined, despite all of his talk about being a new Democrat and their attempt to have Al Gore reinvent government and all that, that was defined by his health care plan, above all, which was regarded as big government, welfare state liberalism, sort of carried to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. And a little bit, I think, also defined in the summer of 94 by the crime bill, which was labeled as social pork, social welfare, midnight basketball. Uh, those two, plus the tax increase, plus some of the social issues as well, sort of defined the Clinton administration as sort of, you know, yet another uh, big government welfare state liberal uh, administration, taking the country in that direction. Republicans ran against Clinton, against the Democratic congressional leadership, for the contract with America. An amazingly clear choice uh, for an off-year election. 
and obviously the voters went went with the Republicans in, in, in striking numbers. You know, Franklin Roosevelt is the only American president, obviously, who won four national elections. Um, but you could make a case that 94, 1994 was Ronald Reagan's fourth national election victory in the sense that he, of course, won in his own right in 80 and 84. He really elected George Bush as his vice president in 88. Uh, and you can make a case that when Clinton helped Republicans nationalize the election and made it sort of the Clinton vision versus the Reagan vision in 94, uh, Reagan did one more um, service for his country, or at least his party, uh, and, and led to the sweeping Republican victory. It is striking how Reaganite the Republican Party was in 94. Uh, there were not a whole lot of Bush Republicans running across the nation. And I don't, I don't say this out of disrespect for President Bush, whom I you know, worked for and I'm proud to have worked for and think was a better president than people realize. But um, even George Bush's sons ran as Reagan Republicans. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, the extent to which Reagan sort of captured the soul of the Republican Party after the collapse of the Bush administration, the extent to which you had a sort of Reagan-Clinton showdown in 94, uh, I think is striking. Uh, exit polling suggests uh, that it was very ideological, the vote was ideological. A very interesting study by Fred Steeper, um, who Witt knows well, who was, uh, was actually the pollster on the Bush Quail 92 campaign, but despite that, is a very good guy and a smart guy. Um, had a very interesting result. It turned out that you would think in a big sweep, like 94, big Republican sweep, everyone would move towards the Republican column. You know, if you look at different groups, there'd be sort of movement to the Republicans among all groups. That really wasn't the case. Uh, Self-described conservative voters uh, voted Republican about 80% in 1994, compared to about 65, 67% throughout most of the 80s. In other words, for most of the 80s, if you conservative, self-described conservatives were about two-thirds Republican voters. In 1994, they became 80% Republican voters. Self-described liberals, who throughout most of the 80s voted Republican about a quarter uh, of the time, about three quarters of them voted Democratic, uh, went Democrat. Uh, liberals did not move to the Republican uh, side despite the uh, landslide or because of the landslide. Uh, the Republican vote among liberals dropped from about 24, 25% to about 18%, steep profound. So you had a polarizing election. Conservatives went Republican. Liberals went even more Democratic. Conservatives went even more Republican than they have. Uh, liberals went even more Democratic than they have. Moderates, basically, and independents kind of stayed where they were, split down the middle. And it was a huge Republican victory because there are about twice as many self-described conservatives in America as self-described liberals. So obviously, if you polarize and you pick up more conservatives and more conservatives go Republican, uh, it's good for Republicans. So it was extremely, an extremely ideological election, which again is, is, I think, symptomatic of its realigning character. Um, the issue of the election was, as a leading Democrat said, government. Al Fromm, the head of the Democratic Leadership Council, said the 94 election was a referendum on government and government lost. And I, I really think that's true in a very simple sense. Um, one of the most striking sort of polling data of the last quarter century is the extent to which Americans have lost faith in government. In the 50s and 60s, Americans believed government, especially the federal government, usually did the right thing, and that's why they voted for candidates who, on the whole, increased the size of government. Uh, that belief has collapsed, where 73 percent of Americans in the late 50s uh, said government usually, all the time, or usually, or most of the time, does the right thing. That number's now in the low 20s. And even in the last few years, faith in, gov in government, confidence in government, especially the federal government, um, has, has collapsed. When Bush beat Dukakis in 88, with this polling question that was asked, um, would you prefer to have more government services and pay higher taxes or fewer services and pay lower taxes? So kind of a fair question. It doesn't take into account the possibility that you could pay lower taxes and also have better services. But, um, but you know, fair, a fairly asked question. It was an even split, actually, about 44, 44 percent, I think. By 92, Americans by 55 to 38 percent. Uh, preferred less government, uh, lower taxes, and even if that meant fewer services. Uh, by 1994, election day of 94, it was 68 to 20 uh, for less government, for fewer services and lower taxes. I think that's what underlies, of course, the, the landslide. The anti-government sentiment, sort of, which has been building up over a quarter century, finally broke through. It's as if the dam had been sort of leaking a little bit and, you know, had been under pressure. And then finally, in November of 94, the dam broke. Uh, and it benefited, obviously, the Republican Party um, campaigning on a platform of 
basically cutting government and portraying the Clinton administration as committed to ever bigger, ever more activist, ever more intrusive federal government. Um, there's, a, there's an Al Gore joke going around Washington that speaks to this issue of faith in government, and I normally don't tell vice president jokes, you know, because I, I object to them on principle. Um, having, having worked for Dan Quayle, who was the uh, subject of so many unfair jokes, but, um, but I figure I should actually try to pay, you know, pay, pay Al Gore back. So the, um, there's a story about Gore, who's been reinventing government, and he, uh, he went to a certain agency to see what was going on, you know, talk to the employees, and he asked one bureaucrat, what do you do? Uh, and he said nothing. And Gore, Vice President Gore uh, asked a second uh, bureaucrat, uh, well, what do you do? Uh, and she said nothing. And Gore took out his notepad and wrote down, too much duplication of responsibilities. That <laughs> uh, sort of, uh, I think that, that sort of says it all about Americans' view of, of government and, and, uh, and government bureaucrats. Um, so we had this realigning election, pretty fundamental election, reflecting pretty deep trends in American public opinion. Um, I think, what happens next? I think we, the one era is over. I do think the New Deal Great Society era is over. That model is gone. One of the striking things about 1995 is that no one is proposing anything like Clinton's health care plan. I mean, the Democrats are doing their best to pummel the Republicans. Um, liberals are trying to defend existing government programs, but there's no impetus anymore for any kind of expa you know, expansion of government or, or trying to leg legitimate government intrusion into new areas. Um, one of the striking things, incidentally, about a realigning election is how fundamentally the debate changes and how fast. Um, I do think that's, that's really, if you really think about politics now compared to four or five months ago, all kinds of issues are on the table that were virtually impossible to raise five or six months ago. Affirmative action is the most obvious question, you know, obvious example, something that would have been sort of politically incorrect to even question four or five months ago now is in the middle of a real debate and I think it will actually be changed. Welfare reform, the debate that's going on, the kinds of reforms that are being proposed, including the democratic reform package, much more radical, much more fundamental than anything that was proposed even by most Republicans a year ago. I think the same thing is happening in a lot of areas uh, of public policy. And again, it's a sign of what happens when the dam breaks. The whole playing field changes. The whole landscape, the whole political landscape alters. And all kinds of things become possible at the federal level and at the state level, incidentally, uh, that weren't possible, didn't seem possible just a year before. A couple of quick comments about 95 and 96. Um, what happens now? I mean, now, having won this big election, Republicans, of course, unfortunately have to actually govern <laughs> and have to govern from the Hill which is very hard, very hard to advance a coherent legislative agenda from Congress, very hard to, to, to win the battle for public opinion without the bully pulpit of the presidency. What the Republicans in Congress are trying to do really hasn't been done in, in modern American politics, to the best of my knowledge, to advance a bold and coherent and very ambitious agenda from Congress, through controlling Congress, uh, without the executive branch. Almost every instance one can think of of this, you know, Reagan in 81, Johnson in 65, uh, required the presidency. Um, we'll see if they can succeed. I think the good news for Republicans is they don't need to do everything. The truth is that when you really step back and ask what would make the Republican Congress a success? What would make voters think 18 months from now that we were right to elect the first Republican Congress in 40 years? You know, that, that we're, and we're going to do it again in 96. I don't think they need to enact everything in the contract with America. And they don't need to not make, mis they're certainly gonna make mistakes along the way and have bumps in the road. I think at the end of the day, if they can pass a budget that significantly slows the growth of federal spending, that gets rid of a bunch of programs, that's really distinct and different from a business as usual sort of federal budget. Um, so if they can cut spending, if they can cut taxes, which I think they do need to do, at least somewhat, and if they can reform welfare, which is the one issue I think that is a crisis, unlike health care. You know, I mean, pe people do think the welfare system is a total disaster, and they will be unhappy if, having gone to the trouble of sending Republican majorities to Congress in 94, mm -hmm. nothing has been done about welfare. But if they can cut spending, cut taxes, and reform welfare, I think most Americans, at least most Americans who are open to voting Republican in any case, um, the majority of Americans, in mid-96 would say, that's a pretty good start. I don't think they need to, you know, do perfectly on every aspect of the contract. Um, and I think that's, in a sense, encouraging for Republicans. 
uh, and for those who would, who would wish their policy agenda well. Doesn't mean things couldn't go wrong, obviously, and they may fail to come through with a good budget, and they may ba back off the tax cuts, and welfare reform is a tough issue, but I think those are the three big things they really have to, almost have to do. And if they do do them, I think most voters will think uh, that's a job pretty well done, and it sort of authorizes or, or entitles them to another couple of years to keep moving along that path, and most importantly, uh, entitles them to have a Republican president to work with to move further down that path. I think voters are more patient than a lot of pundits and, and media types give them credit for. The fact is, in 1994, voters re-elected uh, Republican governors. Uh, they re-elected some Democratic governors, too, such as, such as here. But they re-elected Republican governors by huge majorities uh, in state after state, Michigan, Illinois, Ohio, Massachusetts, California, Wisconsin. Uh, which are tough states for Republicans, states Clinton carried in each of those cases. They reelected these governors by big majorities. Uh, these governors hadn't revolutionized their state. There are still big problems in Michigan and Wisconsin and Massachusetts. But voters basically saw that, Tom, that John Angler and Tommy Thompson and Bill Weld had tried to curb the growth of spending uh, and that they had begun to deliver on tax cuts and that they had tried to begin reforming education and begun reforming welfare. And voters basically said, that's a pretty good start. You know, we're going to give you another four years to move further down that path. And it seems to me that's the model that the Republican Congress probably should have in mind and, 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 and probably and the model, I think, of what will happen if the Republican Congress can do as well as those governors did in pushing through their reform agendas and resisting pressure to, to accommodate uh, and in explaining to people why these agendas are, are, are good for them and, and good for the country. So I think it's, there is evidence, as I say, that voters are not nearly as impatient and short-tempered uh, and, and fickle as, as, some would, as some would say. In terms of 96, so I, mean, I think the things to look for in 95, in a way, is to say in, in October, November of 95, at the end of this year, will Bob Dole and Newt Gingrich be able to stand up and say, the budget is really different than it was if you had had a Democratic Congress? A bunch of programs that existed when we showed up in January of 95 don't exist anymore. Your taxes have been cut, maybe not quite as much as we hope, but you know, there's a real tax cut, both for families and for, and for entrepreneurs, I think. And welfare, we've at least begun to reform welfare. If they can stand up and say that at the end of this year, I think voters would basically say, well, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Then the question becomes 96. To carry through on a real fundamental political realignment, you need to win the White House. The closest uh, analogy to the 1994 election, I think, in modern American history is 1930, when Democrats, who had been the minority party for over 30 years, basically, um, and a pretty distinct minority party, uh, took advantage of the Great Depression and uh, picked up eight Senate seats and 53 House seats, as it happens, almost identical to the Republican pickups this past year, and came to parity in the Congress with the, with the uh, Republicans. <coughs> then in 32, of course, Roosevelt beat Hoover, Democrats picked up like, 97 additional House seats and 12 additional Senate seats and had comfortable majorities. In 1934, the only time this has happened in this century, uh, the party in the White House picked up seats in an off year in Congress. And then in 36, they picked up yet more seats. Roosevelt crushed Landon. And by 1937, Democrats had three and a half and four to one majorities in both houses of Congress and controlled virtually every state house in the country. Um, and that shows how fast these realignments can happen, incidentally, when they start to happen. 1929, solid Republican majorities across the nation except for the South, really, uh, and at the national level. 1937, three, four to one Democratic majorities. Um, I don't think we're going to have something of that magnitude in this decade, but if Republicans won the presidency in 96, extended their hold on Congress, uh, <coughs> held on to the state houses, picked up a few more state legislative chambers, which I think is likely because the South has only begun to tip Republican at the state legislative level, and there are plenty of state legislative chambers now that are close, which should go over to the Republicans in the next couple of election cycles. You could have a pretty big realignment in this country, somewhat comparable to the New Deal. Um, and then the question will be whether the Republican agenda of relimiting government and sort of radical reform of welfare and education uh, you know, takes off and works, or, or, or whether it doesn't, and that's, that's itself a huge question. I'd say one, one, one last comment, and this relates to what you've done here with the Georgia Public Policy Foundation, which I, I really have admired from Washington as, as I followed what you've done. I do think the reform agenda has to be pursued at the state level 
as it is being pursued at the national level. I mean, especially because one of the main elements of the new governing reform agenda at the national level is devolution of power to states. Well, the point of devolving power to states is not to devolve power from, Washington, from bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. to bureaucrats in Atlanta, Georgia, or from the National Education Association in Washington to the Georgia Education Association uh, in Atlanta. The point is to actually get power back to citizens and families and local communities and voluntary institutions. That will require fighting this fight, obviously, at the state level. And just as the, in the earlier revolutions, the New Deal Revolution, the Great Society uh, transformation, you had the liberal reform efforts going on at the state level as they went on at the federal level. So if this is going to be a real realignment of American public policy, uh, it'll have to happen at the state level as at the national level. And I think it has begun to happen in many states. One of the great reasons Republicans won in 94, after all, is that there were all these Republican governors who had been successful in states like Michigan and Wisconsin, and, and, they were, and the con congressional and Senate candidates were able to point to these governors as, as examples that Republican ideas worked. They weren't just, didn't just sound good, they actually worked in practice. But for the realignment to continue and really come through, uh, um, it has to happen at the state and local level for that matter, as well as at the national level, and that's why I think efforts of uh, the state-based uh, public policy uh, think tanks and foundations such as, uh, such as the Georgia Public Policy Foundation are so, are so important. If you really want to you know, uh, get serious about crime, if you really want to improve schools, if you really want to break the cycle of welfare dependency and illegitimacy, that's going to be, that's going to require reform of state policies. We can, we can, the feds can help a little bit, they can get out of the way, they can get more authority back to the states, but all of those are really issues that are resolved at the state and local level. So one of the big tests for the rest of this decade, I think, won't just be what happens in Washington. It'll be what happens in state capitals and really below the level of state capitals and local in cities and counties. Uh, across across the country. Why don't I stop there? And at least we have we have some time for comments and uh, questions. Oh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think that, uh, in fact, once they get through the 100 days and then I think through a good chunk of the budget fight, I expect the Republicans in the House and the Senate to move with reforms that go in the direction you suggested. I mean, I don't think we're going to all at once radically change the employer-based nature of American uh, health insurance, though I think ultimately that would be worth doing and going in the direction of full-fledged medical savings accounts. But I think we will at least move to make uh, health insurance more portable more easily renewable, uh, to even the tax playing field uh, for those who purchase their own insurance as opposed to those who have it purchased for them by an employer. And I think this is important for the Republican Congress to do, at least open the wedge for medical savings accounts so that employers at least can provide medical savings accounts to their employees with the same tax advantage that they get if they purchase their employees' health insurance. And again, we do have the good, the good news here is that we have real world examples from Forbes uh, Inc. and from uh, Golden Rule Insurance and from other companies of, employee, of employers who even within the constraints of the current tax code have given their employees more choice of medical uh, insurance to buy, given them in effect cash and said use this to buy medical insurance and costs, employers or employees are happy and costs have come down. Um, so I think we will see health insurance reform of the sort, of the sort you mentioned and it will happen I think somewhat gradually um, and there won't be suddenly a huge conservative reform plan, you know, a sort of a mirror image of Clinton's that suddenly gets imposed on the nation. But I think what we'll see is steps towards trying to uh, give families or individuals more control over the purchase uh, of, their own, of their own health insurance, which I think would be very good, actually, for medical costs and, and, and for the quality of medical care as well.
I think we will, I think at the end of this year, Congress will have cut the capital gains tax in one way or another, and I'm not sure whether they'll, what combination of indexing, a 40 or 50 percent exclusion, or just conceivably a flat, lower capital gains rate. I'm not sure which of those or which combination of those it will be. But I think they will cut capital gains and they will, and they will give families some form of a tax credit for, for, uh, for children and probably do some of the other tax reforms, though not all of the ones that are in the contract with America. Um, I think tax policy will go on a model like, I think, many other policy areas over the next few years, which I would characterize as sort of a two-step model. I think first we will have some particular reforms that will be useful. Cap gains will be very useful in unlocking capital, I think, and encouraging capital formation. Uh, the pro-family, the, the child tax credit would be nice to begin getting parents back some of the, the value of their of the deduction back up to something like what it was uh, 20 or 30 years ago. But I do think there's also a market out there for much more radical tax reform. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised in, to see if Congress does this in 95, you then get a real serious debate in 96, uh, both at the presidential level and among in Congress, uh, over a radical tax reform of some sort or another, Dick Armey's flat tax, maybe Bill Archer's national retail sales tax, some form of scrapping the current income tax system and um, getting rid of the IRS. Uh, Turns out to be a sort of wildly popular idea, I guess. <laughs> Much to the surprise of everyone in Washington, you know. So, um, so I think, I generally, I think what happens when you get a big realignment like this is you get a first wave of reforms that tend to be a little more targeted and address the particular problems. You saw this in the New Deal. You know, if their banks are closing, you get legislation to keep banks open. The bigger wave of reforms comes two or three years later when people sort of say, well, let's rethink this whole system. What's wrong with it? And I think that's, that looks to me on tax policy as if it would be, would come in 96 or maybe in, maybe 97. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think that would be overly optimistic that from, from what I can read that the, the South is going to be a solid South, the uh, wealth source is enjoying solid South, but Republicans, the balance of power would be tipped between the South and the West. The New York Times is just another newspaper. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. That would be nice if the New York Times were just in a newspaper. It's too bad that all the all these local newspapers print, however, New York Times wire dispatches. You know, so um, I mean, I, I, well, I think the South is obviously going much more Republican, and just demographically, power is flowing, population and, and wealth is flowing south and west. Uh, so all that all of that will matter, and I do think the Republican realignment is finally which has been long heralded in the South, has finally broken through and now is going to keep going for the rest of this decade in a pretty big way. Now, of course, the Democratic Party is going to adjust, uh, just as Republicans adjusted after the New Deal, and, and there will be Democrats winning elections in particular you know, states and, 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 and congressional districts, but I think the whole the tendency will be, will be Republican. Uh, on the sort of breakup of, let's say, New York and Washington as the dominant media capitals and, and all, that's, I think that is happening. I mean, that is, I mean, talk radio is the great instance of that. Obviously, and it, the, it, which is an amazing phenomenon. I mean, really amazing. No one predicted it five or six years ago, and it really has made a difference because it, it has allowed. I'm not sure how many people have changed their political opinions because of listening to Rush Limbaugh or or other you know uh, talk radio hosts. But it certainly has legitimi legitimized and 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 sort of uh, validated people who had certain opinions, thought they were common sense, never had them reinforced in the elite media, and now it turns out, hey, a lot of other Americans agree with this opinion, so maybe, it, maybe I'm allowed to have this opinion in a sense. So I think you already have the breakup of the sort of power of the New York Times, Washington Post, the three networks, and, and I think that it looks to me that just modern technology will continue that, will continue that trend, which is also, I mean, it was obviously contributed, I think, to the election of 94. Just yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very nice. Well, that's very nice for you to say. I'll tell him. I'll tell him you said that. <laughs> he won't. He won't believe it. But. Yeah. Well, of course, no one in Washington thinks they're important or wants to think they're important. I think they're actually quite important. Well, I mean, you all tell me. I, I think there's actually a lot of support for term limits. Everyone in Washington has the sense that. Well, okay, maybe people are for them, 
but this is just an eccentric populist view that people have, and they don't really understand. If they understood, they wouldn't be for them. I actually think the support for term limits is pretty sophisticated out in the country. That is, people know why they like term limits. And they know they're giving up something. That is, there would be some good people who would be limited. But they also know that the whole, the essence of big government, welfare state liberalism, of interest group liberalism, is the interlocking of the committee system in Congress and the seniority that governs the committee system and the safe re-election districts that people get and the interest groups that are regulated by the committees and that make contributions to the to the congressmen and, and, and that then work with the bureaucrats and the agencies, et cetera. I mean, it's that whole iron triangle, you know, that Ronald Reagan criticized, depends on seniority, and it is threatened by term limits. And that's why every congressional staff and, and sort of Washington insiders hate term limits, because they understand that it really is, I think it's the single most effective weapon against that iron triangle. And that's actually why I'm for term limits. I mean, it would be nice to have more citizen legislators and all the other arguments I think have some truth. But I think the, the way in which it, 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 it breaks the iron triangle, and it's the iron triangle that builds in the impetus to ever increased government spending, regulation, and, and government activity. And so I think term limits is a very important part of relimiting government. Once you have government relimited, in a sense, you could then do away with term limits, you know. I mean, but, it, but I think for the short and medium term, which means, you know, quite a while, a couple of decades, term limits are a very important tool. I think Republicans will pay some price for next week when they fail to pass term limits. And it's not so much failing to pass them because, you know, that, that's understandable. They don't have the votes for the constitutional amendment. But, but for the perception of not really wanting to pass them and, in effect, the whole thing's going to be a charade. And it is going to be a charade next week. I believe that something like 375 members of the House will vote for term limits next week because you'll have a phony Democratic alternative that will have retroactive term limits, which is you know, sort of ludicrous. But, um, and they'll all vote for that. And then Republicans will split their votes among the three possibilities. This will allow you know, three quarters of the members of Congress to go home and say, I voted for term limits, while conveniently nothing has passed. I think you know, this will not have a great immediate effect. I think term limits, the rubber hits the road on term limits. If the Supreme Court later this year overturns state-based efforts to limit federal terms, if that happens, which is entirely possible, I mean, I think it's a close call in terms of constitutional interpretation where the states can limit terms of federal office holders under the current constitutional arrangement. If that happens, citizens in 22 states who, and the reason, one reason it's not quite a red-hot issue at the federal level now, remember, is that citizens in 22 states, all the ones that have initiatives and referenda, have limited the terms to their federal officials. So half the country basically is perfectly happy. They think they've done term limits. And it'd be nice if Congress you know, did it too, just to make sure. But now, if the Supreme Court overturns those states, then citizens in 22 states will suddenly wake up and discover they didn't, they haven't limited terms of their federal officials, though they thought they had. Then I think you have a huge populist kind of reaction against the court decision. And then the pressure will be on Republicans, and it should be on Republicans to pass either a statute or a constitutional amendment, depending on which would do the job uh, in terms of the court decision, to, I think, at least allow states to impose term limits. I, I'm not so keen on a national term limits standard. My view on this is, like on a lot of other issues, let federalism work. If citizens of Georgia want six-year term limits on congressmen and 12 years for Senate, that's fine. If Mississippi doesn't think they need term limits, that's fine, too. I mean, I think, in practice, most states will move towards a common standard. But I don't really see that you need a national standard. But I think you need at least to allow states to try to do it. And if the court overturns state term limits, I think you'll have a big issue um, whenever that happens. And it'll probably happen May, June, July of this year. So term limits will be one of those issues that everyone ignores and suddenly could be a huge political issue in mid-95. Because then the question will be which party or which, which presidential candidate in, in, in the Republican Party, let's say, takes the lead in, in helping states, citizens, limit, you know, restore at least the, the, the term limits they thought they'd already legislated. I understand that uh, you're going with, a, uh, you've either gone or going with a campaign? No. It's <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's news to me, but I, I should check my voicemail back in the office, I guess. <laughs> no, I so far have stayed out of it. Um, the, uh, I mean, I've got this little organization I'm running, and, you know, I think I need, I'd like to do that for at least a while longer and try to help make the first year of the Republican Congress successful. Um, but like everyone else, you know, it's like all of you, I'm sure, you're being pursued by candidates to help them in one way or the other. You know, these, they're kind of indefatigable. Um, but no, I'm not involved in the campaign at this stage. But one last, yeah. yeah. That's all.
going to be to be challenged from within the Democratic Party for the nomination, and if so, will that be successful? Uh, who do you predict is going to be the Republican nominee for president, and who will be our next president? I knew we should have cut this off one question <laughs> there. Was, All this made. Uh, why don't you tell me? You just came back from Washington, and you're. <laughs> You're the wizard who wins all these, you know, Senate races and gubernatorial races. Um, the, um, well, I, I personally think, and this is not a majority view in Washington, I think Clinton will be challenged seriously. I think, you know, I don't know anything about it, but I think Whitewater could well pick up in a big way. Um, and I don't think Clinton is very strong within his own party. The one most striking thing after the election that happened to me is, you know, I hang around mostly with Republicans and I know what they think of Clinton. It's not, not too much. But I actually happened to be on the Hill with a bunch of Democratic senators and congressmen. And they really dislike Clinton. I mean, I mean, their attitude towards him was, you know, here we were on top of the world. We'd, we'd uh, survived Reagan. We had defeated Bush. We won everything, basically, in November 92. And this guy comes along, and two years later, it's all ashes. I mean, they really, and so the degree of dislike and sort of fear of Clinton among Democrats and fear of running with him in 96, incidentally, uh, is very great. And right now, he's getting a little uptick in the polls, and he looks okay. But it wouldn't take much to have him come right back down again. And then I think you really will have a, a desire for another candidate. Who runs, you know, I don't know, they're all the same names, you know, Gephardt, Bradley, Kerry, George Mitchell. There are plenty of possible candidates. I think the key in these circumstances is someone has to run. It's like 68 with Johnson. Gene McCarthy, who was not a credible, really presidential candidate, ran. And all you need then is to have one primary where you get 40 percent of the vote, or even a poll, I would say, in this day and age, probably, where you find, get 30 percent of the vote in New Hampshire. And then serious people get in, just as in 68 when McCarthy ran against Johnson, wounded him, and then Bobby Kennedy got in. It seems to me the most likely scenario this time would be someone goes against Clinton, and then it, Clinton looks weak enough that, a gap, that, the, that the party, quote, you know, turns to a Gephardt uh, or someone and says, you've got to save us. So I, I think it's possible that Clinton won't be the nominee. I think basically Republicans should win the 96 election if it's a two-way race. Um, you know, we've won most of the recent presidential elections, and uh, unless the Republican Congress really blows up, or unless, you know, anything could happen, obviously. So, but, you know, basically Clinton got 43 percent of the vote in 92. It's hard to see Clinton picking up 7 percent over his 92 vote. It's hard to see after the chaos of deposing Clinton, if that happens in the Democratic side, that they're going to pick up to 50. So I think in a two-way race, you know, with a reasonably competent Republican candidate and a reasonably competent performance by the Republican Congress, both of which are, are you know, not certain, uh, you'd have to favor the Republican. I don't know who the Republican nominee will be. Um, and uh, I think someone who's, I don't think it'll be a surprise. I mean, I think it'll probably be Dole, Graham, Alexander, or Wilson. Probably Dole, Graham, or Alexander, I would say. And, um, and that'll be... Uh, one of those guys will probably be president in, in 97. But of course, I'm the guy who worked in the, who was in the Bush administration where, you know, George Bush was at 90 percent in the polls at this time in 1991. So I suppose anything could, could happen. I do think third party, I mean, I do think Republicans probably win a two-way race. And the real interesting question for 96 is, what about Perot and what about the Perot voters? If the Republican Congress goes south, then you do have, I think, a market out there for an independent. If Clinton's, not, people are unhappy with Clinton and unhappy with the Republican Congress, then the whole Colin Powell third party scenario becomes, I think, possible. Um, and do Republicans or Democrats get involved in such bitter fights among ourselves or among their, themselves that you get third and fourth parties, which is possible, you know, in both, in both parties. I don't think it's likely, but, but, but it's not impossible. But absent that, I think Republican prospects are pretty good. Thanks.